Good morning, everyone. Let's stand. Let's participate in our devotion. Let's stand. Amen. Amen. We're singing, How Great is Our God. come to the throne of grace. God is good all the time. Amen. Shall we pray? You may be seated. Gracious Father, we, you are a good God. We just thank you for all the many blessings you blessed us with, Heavenly Father. We thank you for your love, grace, and mercy. Today, we gather here to worship you with spirit and truth. To say thanks and praise you, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we just I want your Holy Spirit to surround us this morning, Heavenly Father, especially in our hearts. Bless the one who's going to bring the word, Heavenly Father. The word that's going to encourage us and enlighten us, Heavenly Father, so that when we leave this place, we'll be ready to serve. Heavenly Father, remember those who are sick and shut in, Heavenly Father. Give us, give us healing, Heavenly Father. Give the comfort to the bereaved, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, lift up this Good Shepherd Baptist Church, its members, the visitors, and those watching online. Continue to lift up the uh, pastor search committee, Heavenly Father. Lift up the officers and the ministers, Heavenly Father. Continue to stand by us and be with us, Heavenly Father. We give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praises, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
the church said amen. Amen. The church said amen again. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of worship this morning? Come on and give God a hand clap of praise. The song just said, how great is our God. Somebody ought to be on your feet shouting because you've been through something. God has brought you through something, and you ought to be able to say, how great, how great. is our God. In spite of ourselves, he's still good. Even when you messed up, filed up, tripped it up, he's still good, and he's still yes. God. And beside him, there is no other. So today, with uplifted voices, with uplifted hands, we will worship him for being great in our lives, for being majestic in all that he does. And there's one thing that he cannot do. Y'all know what that is, right? One thing that God cannot do. He cannot ever fail. Amen. So we stand on that this morning. That regardless of what we're going through, regardless of our situations and our circumstances, regardless of how it looks, God will never fail, and he remains to be great. So, Father, we thank you today for this opportunity where, where we are simply invoke your presence. We know that you're already here. You came before us, and you set forth this table for us to dine at. So, Father, as we open ourselves to receive that which you have in store for us today, we ask that your Holy Spirit might come to rest, to rule, to abide, to touch, to heal, to deliver, to strengthen, to equip, to tear down walls, to break us free, to set the captives free from all the things that keep us out of your perfect presence. So today, O oh God, in the house of worship, we simply ask that you have your way and we get out of the way so that you can be God and be great at who you are. If there's anything in us that's not like you, reveal it to us, O oh God, so that we can cast our cares at the altar, so that we can lift our voices and give you praise for deliverance. We can give you praise for the sacrifice of our praise, for the sacrifice of our bodies, for us being here in this place and worshiping you for who you are and all that you do. So we thank you today, O oh God, we thank you today, O oh God, for being great and greatly to be praised. We thank you today, O oh God, that you'll never fail. And we give you all glory, all honor, and praise. And the people of God said together, amen. Come on and give God another hand amen. clap of praise. Our psalm of praise that we shall read together responsibly is the 107th psalm, and you see the verses together. So if you would, please stand as we read our scripture together. Shall we read? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. Whoever is wise will observe these things and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Amen. Our next, for your hearing, our next thing that you will hear is our song of praise, Withholding Nothing, Sister Tammy Williams with our brother Giancarlo.
church. I'm not a singer. I'm a shower singer, but Doug said when he gets you, he gets you, and he got me. Aha! Praise the Lord. Everybody has a praise. Everybody has a song. Ooh, I surrender all to you. Everything I give to you, withholding nothing. You can have it all, Jesus. I surrendered all to you. It's a beautiful testimony, Tammy. 
And that's why she's walking around healed woman. <laughs> healed woman. Because God always has the last say. God says, I speak things that are not as though they were. Because once I speak it into existence, it's now the truth. So the truth is you are healed from the top of your head to the tips of your toes. And the doctors are going to one day go, look, Tammy, everything is clear. We're looking at the results. It's all clear. God did the miracle. But he's already begun it in you. He's already done the work in you. You know that. Praise the Lord. So this week, I am in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, just going through, started, I don't know, back in October or something, or I don't know when, but uh, it's a series called The Path to Anointing God's Leader. I felt moved just to teach a chapter at a time. Uh, so we're in chapter 15. I want to remind us uh, about last week, uh, the last time I spoke, uh, that lesson. Um, so it's review time. We're studying uh, Saul. Now, again, the people wanted a leader, but they thought they could design the perfect leader. We'll tell God what to do, and we do that sometimes in prayer. Lord, I want you to, as soon as we start with those words, we're telling God what to do. I want you to go down the street to, like he's not already there. we got to give him direction. You know, she's on 53rd. Lord, she used to live on 52nd place, but she moved to 43rd Street. Like God was going, what? Let me write all this down really fast. So we don't need to tell God what to do. We want to be those who listen to God and have him tell us what to do. But they told God what kind of leader they wanted, so God gave them what they thought they wanted, and they ended up with a Saul. But he's in his mercy, he was still going to use Saul. But Saul becomes prideful, etc., and starts to mess up. So let's look at what the last time in, in chapter 14, uh, it said, now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side, but he didn't tell his father because his father was home eating pomegranate, sitting on the tree, but he saw something needed to be taken care of, and that was his gift, so he went out and did it. Saul hears about something going on, and he gets nervous, like, what's going on without me? Because sometimes we're nervous, like, who's doing stuff without me? I'm supposed to be the one in charge. Nobody can do nothing without me. And that's because we don't understand the concept of what a leader is. A leader is, Jesus keeps telling us over, the leader is the servant. If you have to be, want to be first, you've got to be last. You're supposed to serve other people. You're not lording it over everybody. That's not what the leader does. So he gets nervous, and in the next verse, uh, it said, Jonathan said to the young man, who bore his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, and it may be that the Lord will work for us. Oh, yeah. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So if God tells you to do something, if God tells you to do something, and that's, the, of course, the key, it's got to be God telling you to do it. But if God tells you to do it, then you can go. It's going to win. You're the majority. So that's when, um, so he's routing the Philistines all by himself. They see the crowd move. And then uh, I think in the next scripture, uh, Saul says to the people who were with him, call the roll and see who has gone from us. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there because he's trying to figure out who is doing this. Who is who's fighting the Philistines? I didn't tell him to do it. So uh, let's see, the next scripture I want to review. So the Lord saved Israel that day. Everybody joined in with what Jonathan was doing. People who had ran away, people who had gone this and that. Thank you to the faithful few who don't depend on the crowd. They're going to show up no matter what. They're going to do anything. But there are a lot of people who go away until it starts to look good. Then they show up, right? Everybody showed up once everything looked good, once they were winning. Thank you to the people who, I, who I'm going to be there and just do what God tells me to do. I don't care if everybody else is there or not. I don't need a crowd. So God saved Israel that day, but the battle shifted to Beth Avon. And now Saul's starting to lose. And he's trying to figure out, why am I losing? I know what I'll do. I'll call a fast. I'll make everybody fast. God did not tell him to do that. So everybody's fasting. Everybody's sick. They haven't eaten. Jonathan's like, this is crazy. Why aren't we eating? Because he hadn't heard about the edict, so he's eating, he's winning, just doing something spiritual because it sounds spiritual. God doesn't honor that. God honors what he tells us to do. 
But you can choose a spiritual thing to do. Well, that seems spiritual. Let's go do that. God won't honor it if he didn't tell you to do it. We'll see that very clearly in a verse today. So when they're losing and things aren't going well, even though they fasted, Saul tried to find out, well, who ate when I said they didn't not to eat? And it came back to Jonathan. Jonathan ate. And so in this scripture, um, the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people uh, tasted food. It's interesting that he says, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies, not on God's enemies. But he's taking a person. It's about me. So like I said, they found out that it was Jonathan who had done it, and he was ready to execute Jonathan. I think the next scripture, uh, Saul answered, God do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. Because I, I said it. I said that whoever is defying me is going to die. And the people said, no, you've gone too far. You've gone too far. In the next verse that I have, the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan die, who has accomplished his great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. So even though Saul's pride wouldn't let him admit that he was wrong, the people stepped in and said, no, this person, Jonathan, is following God, so he's not going to die. We don't know what you're doing. <laughs> we don't think you're following God. But just because you're in that position, that still doesn't mean we're going to follow you if you're not following God. Jonathan, we know, was doing what God wanted him to do. So now, 1 Samuel chapter 15, today's lesson, beginning with verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts. This is Samuel talking to Saul. Samuel the prophet talking to Saul. I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel and how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. I think the next verse says what he's going to do. Now go and attack Amalek. And utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. Kill both man and woman, infant, nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. What did Amalek do to deserve that? What could happen? Oh, my goodness. Kill everybody? What did they do? So I think we're reminded in, in, in Exodus. Is that the chapter? You know, Deuteronomy. So. He says, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt? Just want to stop there. They were coming out of Egypt. They had not bothered anybody yet. They had just crossed the Red Sea. They were not bothering anybody. Here's what Amalek did. How he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks. All the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and he did not fear God. Now, who, if, if a bunch of us, if a thousand of us are all walking down Crenshaw toward the beach. Okay, we won't get there if we do that. Okay, we're walking down Slauson toward the beach. Help me now. And a thousand of us, we're walking, and it's, we're walking a long time. Who's going to end up eventually at the end of the line? The people who are tired, probably the elderly. My mom's probably not going to be in the front. She's going to try to be in the front because that's how she is. She's moving. But the older people are going to be in the back, right, after a while. The little kids are going to be in the back. The sick are going to be in the back. People are not feeling well. That's who Amalek attacked. He says, they came up. you attacked the sick. You attacked the elderly. You attacked the children. You attacked, they came up and picked off one by one the people were in the back. So that's evil. That's evil to, to, to attack those people. I understand attacking someone who's your same size, your say, you know, okay, but when you're going to go attack the elderly, attack the tired and the weak and the sick and the children, that's who they attacked. The women who were, with, who were nursing, that's who they killed. And they continued to attack in that way and continued to bother uh, Israel, even though they had not done anything. Oh, wow. Hadn't done anything. And this is 200 years later. God gave them 200 years to repent. They still didn't repent. Let's look at the next scripture. So therefore it shall be. When the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around, this is God prophesying in the future. Here's what I'm going to do. In the land in which your God has given you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. You shall not forget. Do not forget this. That eventually I'm going to get
give them. Why does God wait to get them? Because he gives everybody the opportunity to, to repent. No matter how evil or how bad you are, he's giving Amalek a chance to change. God does not instantly judge. He gives you the opportunity to repent. But Amalek was, just got worse and worse and worse. So he says, now you're going to have to get rid of Amalek. Wow. Uh, let's look at the next scripture. So I'm skipping ahead. So he, Samuel has his orders, right? I mean, Saul has his orders. Go destroy Amalek, kill all of them. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. I need to stop there with that word regret. This is actually a nice translation. It actually means the the real word is repent. And the people who translated the New King James, they were afraid to put the word repent in there because they think God can't repent. That would mean God did something wrong. So they didn't put the word because they have the wrong understanding of what repent means. Repent just means change. I am changing. I am changing. Repent. We, repent, sinner! That doesn't mean cry and weep. Repent actually means change. A lot of people cry and weep, and they don't change. <laughs> Those of you who are parents may have had a child get caught doing something, <laughs> and two weeks later they're doing the same wow. thing. They didn't change. They, crying and weeping and snotting, uh-huh. that's cool. That doesn't mean you're changing. Uh-huh. Repent means change. So you can have sorrow for your sin. I'm so sorry I got caught. I'm so sorry I wasn't quick enough to get out of here before you came in and caught me. That doesn't mean you're changing. When he says, I'm changing my action toward Saul. So doesn't, regret is the wrong word because God, God already knew what Saul was going to do. So why is he repenting? Why is he changing toward Saul? Let's give an, an example. I'm going to give you an example in the Bible when God changed in action. Uh, It says, when the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented. Now, they use the word relent, but they should have said repent. But they're scared to put the word repent in the Bible because they have the wrong idea. God changed from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, it is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arunah, the Jebusite. Now, here's what Israel had done. Israel had started counting the people. They needed to know how many people are here because in case they came, like, oh, good, there's 100,000 of us. There's only 50,000 of them. We can win. We need to know exactly how many people are here because that will determine whether or not we can win. God said, don't do that. Don't count the people because if there's only two of you, you can still win. If there's one of you, you can still win. If you got your hand tied behind your back, if I've sent you, you can win. Stop counting the people. You know what's interesting? Um, the church, I, through the years, and like AJ would know this, uh, Eugene, you know, we had 100 people, 200 people, 300, 400, lots of people through the years at the church. Um, right now, even though we have not that many people, our needs are met. Our bills are being paid. We have a surplus with just a few people. There are times when we've had hundreds of people and have been in debt. So God, we, God says, don't look at how many people. I, I'm going to bless you if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So they got in trouble for counting the people. So an angel stretched out, and he's just destroying the people because I told you not to do it. And then it says God relented. God repent, God changed from sending judgment to sending mercy. So in Saul's case, he says, I'm repenting from what I'm, I was sending mercy towards Saul. I'm now going to send judgment. I was sending mercy. I was giving Saul a break. I'm now changing and I'm going to send judgment and I'm sealing it and it's done. Judgment is coming his way. So let's go back, coming to the next scripture. Here's why. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried out to the Lord all night because of what God was saying. I am no longer, I'm changing my action toward him. I'm no longer sending mercy his way. 
because he's turned from following me. And he cried all night. Now, Samuel knew this, right? Samuel had warned the people. Samuel said, don't, you don't want Saul. I'm telling you, they go, no, we're going to have Saul. You don't want Saul. No, we're going to have Saul. Okay. But when God pronounced this judgment on Saul, it grieved him. So today I'm preaching on why we must grieve for Saul. We must grieve for Saul. We must grieve for Saul because judgment is coming. The Sauls of this world, the Sauls of those, whoever those people are who think they're following God but are not, who are not following themselves, we, our response is to grieve. Samuel cried all night. As, as, instead of going, ha, ha, I knew it. I've been waiting for this to happen. He cried all night. So what had Saul done specifically to do this? What is the specific thing? Because God had given him the orders, kill all of Amalek. Kill them all. So let's uh, look at the next scripture. So Saul attacked the Am- Amalekite. Help me. Amalekites, I knew it, I knew it, I had it. Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur. This from like a Saudi Arabia down to Egypt all the way up to Jordan. He, he attacked them all over the place, which is east of Egypt. How, next verse. So the king, oh, let me tell you um, about Saul. And that's the next verse? Okay, see how I am. Okay. Um, here's the problem with a King. He, he, he attacked him, but he did not attack King Agag, A-G-A-G, A-G-A-G. He did not, he saved him. So the king took, so 200 years later, they're in bondage. They're in um, Babylon. And... All the kings, have been, all the Jews have been captured because they've gotten in trouble. And it says, the king took a signet ring from his hand and he gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Now, had he, had he, so this is an ascendant of King Agag, right? He has the power now to order the death of all the Jews. What's the next verse? And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. So he orders a holocaust. And he says, I'm going to kill them. And he came just hours away from killing all of the Jews. This is a descendant of King Agag, who is the king of all the Amalekites. And so if it wasn't for Esther, pointing out that it was a woman, God used used to save, rescue all the Jews. Uh, there are still people that think God only uses men because, because they haven't read the Bible. <laughs> God be using them women all the time. Yeah. So he used a woman to rescue all the Jews. Yeah. Okay, so next verse. So uh, Saul and the people spared a gag and the best of the sheep. So he said, Kill them all. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlands, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. Even though God said utterly destroy them, they thought, eh, do we have to listen to God? Eh, not really. Who, who'd they get that from? They got that from Saul. And why, did, why would Saul save King Agag? It made him look good. Look at my trophy. I've captured this king. So I, because if you kill him, nobody, who's going to see? But if I can parade him around everybody, then everybody can see, look how powerful I am. But everything despised and worthless, they did destroy. Why? Because they were, this is how people got paid, by the way. You used to go in and you'd fight for the army, with the army, and, and then you would gather the spoil and take him back home, and that was your pay. God said, don't take any pay, destroy everything. They said, no, we're going to take a little bit. So they took all the best stuff back with them to uh, Israel, and 
the bad stuff, they said, eh, it's not even worth our time. You would do that if you were house cleaning, going through your garage. I didn't throw that stuff away, but no, stay, save this good stuff. So they saved all the good stuff. Next. First the reason we have to um, mourn for Saul is he treats God's word like a menu from which he can pick and choose. God said, destroy them all. Well, we kept the best. And when God tells us, and the, the whole Bible, the entire Bible is what we are supposed to read and obey. Too many people pick out the parts that they like and the parts that they don't like, they don't do. Well, the Bible says this. Well, yeah, but it also says this. And yeah, well, I'm not going to listen to. <laughs> we were, Remember that there was a person who, you know, I remember at one of our meetings, we, well, it doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, we, you can't pick and choose is all I'm saying. You can't say, well, I don't want to listen to that. I, I know the Bible says that, but I'm not going to listen to that. Like, no, you can't just pick parts of the Bible. So that's the first reason we must grieve for Saul. He really feels all the Saul's, and Saul could be a woman, could be a child, it could be, I'm just saying, whoever that Saul person is who's been put in a leadership position, but now thinks they can do whatever they want. Okay, next verses. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed, he set up a monument for himself, and he has gone on a round passed by and gone down to Gilgal. So he set up a monument for himself. Look what I did. And he set up this monument and built a monument. They think it was this archway that he built because he wanted to commemorate his, his visit. Saul wants to be remembered, right? So that's why Saul will create monuments. I need everybody to know that I was here. So let me build this Thing to myself so everybody can worship and say, look how incredible I am. So he built a man monument. So the second thing is the monument he builds for himself won't disguise who he really is. That's the problem. You build a monument and say, here, look at how incredible I am. Whatever your monument is, whatever you think, feel that is, whatever you're building to have so everybody can, oh, well, you know, remember well. you, we still know who you are. It won't disguise, we'll, we'll still know. You can build as many monuments. Saul built a monument, but we, we know the truth about him. So it doesn't disguise anything. It doesn't, doesn't fool anybody. Next verse. So Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. Aren't I good? I, I performed the, now he knows he didn't. But, well, I think this is the next reason we have to, to uh, mourn for him. He's deluded himself into believing he's following God. He's deluded himself. I'm, I, congratulate me. Right. That's how I really look. No, it's not. <laughs> I can still wear those skinny jeans. No, you can't. Stop it. That's not who you are. I still look. No, you don't. I don't have a belly. Yes, you do. You look like three months pregnant. What? So you, we delude ourselves into thinking, I'm following God. Everything I'm doing, this is what God told me to do. No, it's not. You're making things up now, Saul. Next. So Samuel said, well, then what then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear? If you destroyed all the sheep and the cattle, am I crazy? Why do I hear all the sheep? What's going on? So he says to him, Saul says, well, they have brought them from the Amechalites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we've utterly destroyed. But you know how the people are. So I think here's the next reason. I think what's next is he is never going to accept responsibility for his actions. That's why we have to grieve for Saul. 
whoever the Sauls are in the world, they're never going to accept responsibility for their action. They're, ne they're never going to do it. We, you expecting at some point they're going to go, I messed up, I was wrong. They're never going to say that. Never, 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 never. We just have to deal with it. But that's horrible. David repented. God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people who will repent and change and say, oh, my God, that's me. David, who was a mess. Saul was not a mess. Here's what's interesting. Saul wasn't a mess other than his pride. David was a mess as far as his life was concerned, but he was always repenting. I'm so sorry, Lord. Forgive me. Try me, Lord. Create me a clean heart. I'm so oh, And God says, okay, you I can use because you know when you're messing up. Saul, I can't use you anymore because you refuse to admit you're messing up. You're just never going to admit it. Next. So Samuel says to Saul, be quiet. Because Saul's just, I, I, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. So he says, then we'll speak on. So now Samuel is telling him. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Wow. So here's the picture, right? You, 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 you were little and God was big. You were little, God was big that change you remember how scared he was remember that Saul was hiding he said in the stuff but I you know I can't do this you're right you can't do it I'll do it but suddenly Saul started thinking I can do this no you can't you still can't do it it's God doing it through you I don't care how many songs you sing care how many things you preach how much money you give how many buildings you what it doesn't matter God's doing it. As long as you stay little in your own eyes and God stays big, we're good. Next. So why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? What changed? So, so it used to be, uh, it used to be God, you were little, God was big. When did it go like this? What changed? Why should we grieve for Saul? I think the next thing tells us, because he has now become his own God. He was little. Remember you were little in your own eyes and God was big? Now you're big and God has vanished. From your sight. You don't see You just see everything that you want to do. That's all you see is your will, your plan, your way. God can come down and tell you, destroy all the Mechalites, and you go, eh. We're going to still save some because you, you're now God in your own eyes. Next. And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone on the mission in which the Lord sent me, and I brought back Agag, king of, the, um, of Amalek. I've, I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. I've destroyed them all. He hasn't. He didn't. We, we know later that he hadn't destroyed them all. Not only had he saved King Agag, but he hadn't destroyed all the, Amal of, uh, the Amalekites. I think that in the next verse. So at the end of the chapter, when we get to chapter 20, 31, Here's what happens to him. Saul says to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. He went out to fight the Philistines. He wasn't supposed to. But he's his own God now, right? He, he gives himself the orders. And so he's losing horribly, so badly that he can tell they're about to come and kill him. So he says to his armor bearer, kill me. Thrust me, draw your sword, thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. You kill me first. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it and killed himself. 
So that's how his life ends when we get to 31. We're only in chapter 15, but when we get to chapter 31, that's how his life ends. He kills himself. Now, here's what someone told David just 20 verses later in 2 Samuel chapter 1. It says, now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites. Now, see, the Amalekites are still alive. David's having to slaughter them. It's 20 years later that David had stayed two days in Ziklag. And then this kid comes up to him with Saul's sword and Saul's crown. Here's what he says to him. And he said to me, who are you? So I answered. So the kid's telling a story. I just came back. I just came back from seeing Saul, and Saul said to me, "Who are you?" And I answered him, "I'm an Amalekite." Now remember, Saul said he killed all the Amalekites, right? So he says, "I'm an Amalekite." Next verse, and he said to me again. This is him telling the story about what happened with Saul. Please stand over me and kill me, for anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. Now he's lying. Because this is not how Saul died. This kid came up, saw Saul dead, picked up his sword and crown, and now he's telling this story to David. He's saying, hey, David, here's how all this happened. Uh, here's how I got, you know, I was standing there, and he said, who are you? I said, I'm a Melekite. And he, he said, well, then stand over me and kill me. Now, he's thinking David will like this story. Because Saul came after David over and over. Saul kept trying to kill David. So you're going to love this story. I killed Saul. Aren't you going to congratulate me? You're going to let me keep his sword and crown, aren't you? Next. So I stood over him and I killed him because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have I brought them here to my Lord. So he thinks he's going to get an award for it. Now, that's not how, that's not how it ends. As you Bible people know, that's not how it ended. But he thinks he's going to be awarded for it. Now, he's lying. That's, I just read to you how it ends. Saul killed himself. But Saul lies about the Amalekites and says, I killed all the Amalekites, and at the end of his life, and the Amalekites lying about him. Isn't that interesting? Here's another reason we have to grieve for the Sauls of this world. His life and demise will always be defined by his lies. His life and death is going to be defined by... That's what's sad at this point. All the great things that Saul has done, all we're going to remember that he lied about the Amalekites and at the end of his life an Amalekite lied about him. And that is now defining his life. Just the lies that he's telling himself. That's all that's left. Okay, so here's what's next. But the, so here... But the people took the plunder, sheep and oxen, and the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice the Lord your God in Gilgal. So this is Saul is still explaining, I mean, Saul is still explaining his story. The people took the best of it. It's not my fault. The people took the best of the sheep. It's, it's them. They did it. Next verse. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Now, this is why I say this, because he's telling him the people took the best of it and offered it to the Lord as a sacrifice. God says, I didn't tell you to do that. Has God as much delight in burnt offerings as in obeying it? I would rather that you obeyed me. Right? So you're a parent and you said to your child, I want you to stay home tonight. Don't go anywhere tonight. When you get home, <laughs> the child is gone. They come in two hours later. Uh, where have you been? Well, I went to a party, but, but I washed your car. I know I took your car and left and disobeyed you, but I washed it. Isn't that good? No. I told you to stay home. I don't care that you washed my car. You, you disobeyed me. 
That's why it says to obey is better than sacrifice. Behold, oh, that's what it says. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. God doesn't care. You can do a spiritual thing, but if God didn't tell you to do it, you can say, let's all pray. There's nothing wrong with prayer unless God asks you to sing. Stop praying. Let's all fast. That's good to fast unless God told you to go out and witness. God's not impressed that you're doing a spiritual thing. He's impressed that, he's, that you're obeying him, whatever he told you to do. Next. So he thinks only what you do to impress Christ will last. Let me tell you as it, well, here's a person with a beautiful voice right here. And, and, and Deacon Sutton, beautiful voice, would sing, only what you do. I remember I, I was singing it because I could hear him singing, you may build great cathedrals, large and small. He loved to sing that song. I'm sure he's still singing it <laughs> where he's at. And, and, and I, I didn't understand the words as a child. Well, if you build great cathedrals, isn't God impressed? He said, like, no. Not if God didn't tell you to build that. You can build great cathedrals, right? You can do all those things. If God didn't tell you to do do it, it's not going to last. It eventually is going to crumble and fall down because only what you do for Christ will last. But if you're trying to impress him, that's not, God, God's not, Okay, <laughs> I'm not impressed because you didn't follow me. You didn't do what I asked you to do. Next. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Why? So witchcraft is when you conjuring a spell, I'm going to make Johnny Cox fall in love with the next person who walks in the room. Oh, I'm going to put a spell on you. Now, I'm trying to control things. Your rebellion is like witchcraft because you're trying to control things. You're not listening to me. You're now trying to create what you think should happen. That's why we have to be careful when we're praying. Some of our prayers are witchcraft, accidentally. Lord, I want you to go and do this. And Lord, do this. And we're telling God. We're going to manifest the thing. We're going to make it happen. I'm going to, you, only things that God has told you are going to happen, that's what he's going to do. What you want to happen, God's not going to do. He's not our servant. He's not our waitress. God will do, we're supposed to, we take down God's order and do what he says, but we think we can just tell God what to do. And that's not how prayer works. So your rebellion as a sin of witchcraft and your stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Now, he said this earlier, way on, but this is the official, the reason we're grieving for the souls of the world, this is the reason why Samuel grieved for him, is because now God's saying, I'm changing. I was being merciful, merciful. Now my judgment is beginning. And from now on, all the things that Saul touches are going to fail. And wouldn't, if, God, if it was God's mercy, Saul's life would have ended immediately. Because it's God's judgment, he's prolonging Saul's life. And judgment's going to fall on him. Everything he sets his hand do, to do from now on will crumble and ultimately fall, which is a shame it doesn't have to be that way. But I can, God's saying, I can see in his heart now his stubbornness. Well, not like God didn't. I'm now revealing. I'm, God already knew, but I'm now revealing to everybody. Now everybody can see. Because I gave this order. Samuel didn't do it secretly. Samuel said in front of everybody, go and destroy all the Amalekites." And Saul said, we don't really have to listen to that. Let's just keep the best, and we'll do what we want. And so now his wickedness is exposed to everyone, and now God is beginning his judgment on his life. So we have to grieve for him. What's the next 
next verse. So Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. I mean, I obeyed them. You know, they made me do it, which is crazy, because Saul's been the one giving out orders all this time, right? No one can eat. Go do this. Go the. I, 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 well, I messed up because of the people. Next. Now, therefore, please just pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. So here's what he's asking to do. Remember all those, the best of the sheep and all that that we've already taken care of? Come with me and let's, let's, let's continue what I was already doing. Yeah, I get it. I'm wrong. But let's keep doing what I was doing that was wrong. Come, let's worship the Lord. Let's go back and finish the sacrifices. It's like, no. So Samuel says, no, I'm not going with you. I refuse to go with you. Remember, he, and so Saul grabs his garment, and Samuel keeps walking, and it tears, and he tells him, now I'm tearing, the, God, this is how God is tearing the kingdom away from you. He's tearing it now from you. He put it in your hands, but now it's torn. The next verse. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today. And has given it to a neighbor of yours who's better than you. And he just means better at following my orders than you. So this is the turning point. This action that you have now done, you've crossed the line. And now it's been torn. And there'll be just judgment from now on in your life. So we grieve for him. Next. Because his act of desperation will boomerang. We agree. So listen, in his desperation, he tore it. So Samuel says, now it's going to be torn from you. That's like uh, you kick something and God says, well, now you're going to get kicked. Uh, you slam the door on something and God says, well, now I'm slamming the door on you. The thing that Saul did. I'm going to shut the door. Okay, now the door is being shut on you. So that act of desperation that he did to try to stay, don't leave, don't go, and it was torn, that's going to boomerang in his life. And, and, and so we grieve for Saul. All the souls of this world, whether men, women, old, young, because they've moved to a place now where God is changing toward them in that now my, now God says in Jeremiah, I want you to know me that I'm the Lord who executes mercy, judgment, and righteousness. That's who I am. If you do certain things, my mercy side comes out. You do certain things, my righteous sides come out. Certain things, my judgment side comes out. But I'm always those things. And so we want to stay in his mercy. But sometimes we finally do an act, and God says, and now my judgment is being waged on you. So here are the last verses. So also, he says, the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent. I said the same word, repent. He's not going to change again. Now that he's pronouncing it, he's not lying. His judgment is coming. He's not going to relent. He's not going to hold back what he's doing. The judgment is coming. For he is not a man that he should relent. He's not going to go, oh, I feel sorry for you. Now the judgment is there. Therefore, David took, oh. Now, remember the story? about um, the kid who came to David and bowed and said, look what I've done. I killed Saul. Aren't you proud of me? And he was lying. He was lying. He says, therefore, David took hold of his own clothes and he tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And David should have been rejoicing. Yay, this person who's been attacking me, yay, he's finally dead. But he tore his clothes. Next verse, and they mourned 
mourned, and they wept, and they fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan, his son. Now, Jonathan was there because Saul had dragged him along with him. So Jonathan ended up dying too because Saul had dragged him into his sin. For the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. All the people, here's who they're mourning for. They're mourning for Saul, for Jonathan, his son, for the people of the Lord who had followed them, and for the house of Israel, because all of them had fallen by the sword, because they were following and doing what Saul wanted them to do. And they wept. Is that the final scripture? Then David said to the young man who told him, where are you from? And he answered, I'm the son of an alien. I'm a, I'm a foreigner. I'm an Amal- Amalekite. And again, these are the people that God told Saul to get rid of. They ended up killing him at the end of his time. And he says to him, next. So David said to him, how is it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? You're not even from here. How, why weren't you embarrassed or afraid to do that? That's still God's anointed. You understand why we have to grieve as opposed to, you, we don't triumph over somebody else's loss. We don't go, yay, ha, ha, look how God got for them. That's still God's anointed that's, that God has his hand on. So when people are missing, when the stalls of this world are missing it and not doing what they're supposed to do, we grieve. Because that's still, how dare you? You don't kick someone when they're down. If you came up on Saul and he was already dying, you weren't afraid to then kill him. You don't put the knife in after the person's already down, right? You found, if you're saying that you found him, which was the lie, and he was on his own sword, you don't kill him. If God's doing something, you let it happen, but you don't add to it. We don't stick the knife into Saul to make it worse. We grieve for that stubborn heart. Let's bow our heads. Father, help us to be those that really feel your heart and understand that it's a terrible, sad thing if someone is missing out on your will, if someone's become stubborn like Saul and they're not seeing what you want them them to do, that they've already begun to create their own, own rules and, and, and be their own king, and that they are perverting your word and just picking the parts that they want. Help us to grieve for that, like Samuel, who cried all night, because we want people to hear you. We want them to be at the point where they truly honestly repent, not just for show, that they don't repent and then say they're repenting and go back to the very same actions. And we want to be those who do that same thing. Lord, help us not to be a Saul. Help us not to think, oh, I'm doing God's will. I'm just doing. Help us to check ourselves, Lord, all of us, so that we know that we're standing in your word firmly and not a word we've created in our heads. Because if we're not doing your will, our sin is like witchcraft. Our rebellion, our stubbornness is like idolatry because we're worshiping ourselves instead of worshiping you. So help us, Father, simply to trust in you and not our own devices, not what we think, but what we truly have heard from you so that we can find true repentance and mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just quickly as the service is ending, we uh, is there anyone who's visiting here for the first time? Because we certainly want to acknowledge you if there's anyone who's visiting. All right. Um, welcome to everybody. I do want to thank, again, those who served the ushers who were here serving. We want to thank you. Uh, we want to thank... Um, Giancarlo, who played for Tammy, who sang so beautifully. Amen. Um, 
and Alexander and Ernest who are working the screens and all all that, the deacons, all, all those who are serving. And again, thank you for being here and fellowshipping together because it's our fellowshipping and our loving one another that is helping us fulfill what Christ wants because we're the body and we have to be together and love one another. That's how we're going to grow. Um, there's some quick announcements. Uh, again, for your offering, if anybody's watching at home or if you're here just reminding you to go to Good Shepherd MBCLA, Missionary Baptist Church LA. You can give. There's a green button that you push, and you can and you give your offering there. Um, uh, at the end of the church, we'll do what we normally do. Um, the next announcement: There's a the joint board meeting Saturday, first Saturday in April, from nine to eleven again on on Saturday. Uh, Next is uh, the Good Shepherd presents the Easter party, which is the Youth Community Fun Day on Saturday, April 8th, starting, I think it's from 1 to 4. There'll be food, games, prizes. I think we might have some flyers for you. But on, that, on the first Saturday, we want everybody to come out. We want the community to come out. There'll be taco trucks and all sorts of fun games. And so we want to fellowship together, especially the youth. Um, but if you are a 70-year-old youth, come on out too. Uh, but we want the kids to come out especially. And, and just right in the parking lot, there's all, all sorts of stuff set up. So you're going to have a great time. The very next day is Easter. Our, so our Easter service will be an Easter service musical like we normally do on Easter and on Christmas. So we know that you'll, you'll be present and uh, we'll be able to worship the Lord together from, just from 11 to 12, the same as we normally have. And I think, is, there, is that all the announcements? Yes. So if anyone is at home, we're just inviting you that if you're watching, if you happen to be on Facebook or on our, on our and see this service. If you want to accept the Lord, it's a simple thing to do. This, just you, it's simple to say, Jesus, come into my heart. I want your mercy. I want you what you've done for me on the cross. I want that. So please be my Lord and Savior. And it's such a simple thing. He makes it simple. He says, I tell the door, knock. You just have to open the door and, and let him in. If you do that, if you're at home and say that simple prayer, and I know you want it to be a big, long prayer, but it's a simple thing, we'd love for you to call in and let us know that you've prayed. We, our church phone number is 323-232-0956, or if there's any sort of need that anyone has at home and you, you can't make it out, please call and leave a message. And, and our deacons and our trustees and our ministers would love to pray for you. Um, and, and I, uh, there's, we have Bible study Wednesday night, uh, online right now. It's on our Facebook page. It's also uh, on our, um, website and also Sunday school where we're going through the book of Exodus. Now, before we go, I just, are, are there any other announcements? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. And the next steps, again, will be, uh, now that we know the results, and pretty much the church says that uh, we didn't have a preference. We weren't saying it had to be what age or how tall you had to be. Or for the most part, the church said we just leave it up to God. <laughs> so um, we will uh, 
be sending out applications, uh, and, uh, and I mean not sending them out to, you know, but making them available. And uh, we'll be starting that process soon. And so we'll be seeing who God is going to be sending in or to uh, apply to be a pastor here. And at a certain point, we'll be scheduling the speakers so that you can be here and, and listen. And the church, it's a decision. Even though the pastor search committee simply created the application in that process, it's the church who decides. So the church will be listening, and then you will be praying, and whoever God speaks to your heart, then the, we'll come together and, and, and vote. So that's something that the church will do. The search committee is just simply putting the process together, but the church votes. Okay, if there's not anything else, uh, let's stand and be dismissed. Father, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your spirit being here today. We thank you for your word that was given through the song, through scriptures, through the spoken word. Also, your word just giving when we love one another or smile at one another. We thank you that we want to be those who don't choose a Saul, but that we choose the David that you have for us. So help us constantly stay in your control. Stay listening to you so that we can be your servants, that we can remain little in our, our own eyes and realize that you've got it all in control. It's all in your hands. So we surrender all to you, as Tammy said earlier. We give it all to you, withholding nothing. And we give you the glory, Father. Now unto him is able to keep you from falling. The only wise and true Savior be all majesty, power, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.